Hi there, thanks for joining us yet again. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley. It's uh, always good to have your company. Coming up in this episode, we are going to be fixing thrusters on Voyager 1. Yep, they had to call roadside assistance and it worked. Uh, We're also uh, looking at uh, a little bit of new information that's uh, been put out in the form of a paper from a space scientist who has found a way for making Apophis, the asteroid, hit Earth. Yes, (laughs) just what we wanted. Um, The odds are pretty smidgy, but he's found a way. And we're going to talk about an amazing photograph taken by Alma of a not-so-nearby red giant star, but what they've learned from it is extraordinary. That's all coming up on Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us once again to rattle off all his knowledge in five seconds flat is Professor Fred Watson. Hello. Hello, Andrew. Yes, actually, five seconds is quite optimistic, really. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's uh, it's what, uh, about five months since I finished my live radio career and I'm starting to get questions like, didn't you used to be on the radio? (laughs) It didn't take long, did it? (laughs) <laughs> oh gosh! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People forget these things, you know. No, yeah. No, no, what do, or what? Where do I know your name from? That that I get that one. I get that one a lot. But um, and I say, ah, uh, full back for the Sydney Swans. Oh, you because, could say that. That's right. Yeah, because yeah, there was an Andrew Duckley who played for the Sydney Swans AFL team years and years ago. I interviewed him when he retired. Which was fun. Andrew Dunkley interviewing Andrew Dunkley. Yeah, <laughs> I hope he enjoyed the joke. Oh, he did. Yeah, he, that's why he wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Uh, Fred, let's um, let's get down to business, as I tend to say more often than not. And uh, I think we'll start with uh, Voyager One. Uh, they've been um, you know, like they've been following this project since. Oh, I won't say the year, but it's been 47 years, I think, that it's been operational. Of course, uh, it's done what it was sent out to do, but it's still going. But because it's getting old and tired and taking high pressure, uh, high blood pressure tablets and a few other things, it's um, it's starting to break down. Things are not working as they once did, and now they've run into a... a uh, well, they, they ran into an interesting problem, which they found an ingenious solution to, uh, involving the thrusters. So, uh, what, what happened there? It's tr- it's absolutely true. This is a story that um, I, you know, it's a delightful story in that it's got so many different twists and turns, and just gives you an uh, a kind of uh, you know an illustration of how ingenious space engineers can be. Uh, it's really quite uh, remarkable. Uh, just uh, let's just catch up with Voyager One statistics as they stand at the moment. Uh, it is uh, a distance from the sun is one hundred and sixty four point six eight two astronomical units, uh, which uh, means basically it's a long way off. One astronomical yeah. unit is one hundred and fifty million kilometers. Uh, so we've got uh, yeah we've got a very very long way away and it's so far away that signals from Voyager one take twenty two nearly twenty three hours to get to us almost a day so um, yeah it won't be that long before it's a light day away uh, yeah. and um, its speed still the fastest object leaving the solar system sixteen point nine three one kilometers per second relative to the sun. Uh, and it is still functioning as well. Uh, and yes, 57 years is correct. It was launched uh, almost to the day, actually. It's uh, September the 5th, 1977 was the launch date. So what's the story? Well, it is that uh, the probes, uh, both Voyager um, probes, um, they, they have uh, three sets of thrusters. Uh, and these are small rocket motors. Uh, there are two sets that give you uh, attitude adjustments. In other words, 
how the telesc- sorry how the uh, spacecraft is sitting as it drives along is it facing the earth is it facing out into space is it looking back towards the sun um, and so two of them do that and then there's a further set that uh, does what's called a trajectory correction um, and that means uh, changing its path its uh, orbital path which of course was necessary in its in the earliest stage of uh, of its mission uh, because you need it to make these corrections mid course corrections they're often called uh, en route to the planetary destinations voyager 1 was the one that uh, sussed out jupiter and saturn and you know everybody else out there so uh, it uh, it was a, a, a basically a, a very important part of the navigation of of uh, voyager 1 but that set of thrusters doesn't work uh, doesn't is not needed anymore the trajectory correction thrusters you don't need because you don't have a target you're not going anywhere particularly you're just leaving yeah. the solar system just going getting that away get, yeah getting the hell out of here so <laughs> um what it meant was um back in 2002 uh when they uh when Engineers, it's actually uh, at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where the NASA engineers are who who look after this uh, marvelous, marvelous machine. Uh, when they found that there was some of the fuel tubes uh, in the uh, attitude correction branch uh, being gummed up uh, by, and I'll explain what gums them up in a minute, but they were getting gummed up. So what they did was switch to the, one of the other ones. Uh, that was in 2002. And then they clogged up in 2017. So they finally switched to the tra- trajectory correction uh, uh, ones, which are the ones that you don't use anymore. Uh, so what yeah. you can do is you can use those thrusters to still keep the spacecraft with its antenna pointing back to Earth, which is the critical thing here. Because if we lose that, then we've lost it. So Mm. they are still operational, and they have been since 2017. Now, unfortunately, uh, however, they are clogging up too. Uh, And that's, you know, it must sound like a familiar story to these engineers. Uh, What is it that clogs them up? It's silicon dioxide. And apparently... This is a sort of chemical byproduct uh, that comes originally from a, a rubber diaphragm that's in the fuel tank, Voyager 1's fuel tank. Uh, and as the fuel tubes clog up, as you'd expect, uh, the thrusters don't work very well. Um, and you, you probably need to run them for longer to get the same fuel through. I, I do yeah. remember in the days when I used to... When I used to um, uh, service my own cars uh what happened if you had a a, a blocked up fuel filter uh, the engine didn't do much <laughs> that's the same sort of thing if you if your uh, fuel tube is blocked up you, you're not going to get much thrust out of it so uh the, the, but there is um technology uh that sort of allows them to clear that um and uh what what you have to do is, you know, sort of develop an, an innovative solution. Uh, you heat it up. Uh, you basically heat the tubes up, and that uh, gets rid of the clogging. Uh, so um, that's what's going to happen. They will they will heat these tubes up. But if you do that, then you're taking power from other things on board and they've already switched off power to everything that they think is non-essential so and and so it's it's running all it's what are perceived to be essential components so what do they switch off (laughs) that's right and so well what they've what they've done is they have and and i should explain that the heat for the power for these heaters actually comes from the little RTG, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is a bucket of plutonium, basically. Uh, and so um, what what they've done is that they have decided, rather than turn off the power to one of the instruments and risk it not coming back up again, uh, which is kind of what happens with old electronics. I'm always reluctant yeah. to turn off my old computer in case it just doesn't switch back on again. Um, so rather than do that, they're going to do something a lot more 
straightforward in a sense, but perhaps more risky. Uh, they're going to turn off the space, one of the spacecraft's main heaters, and these are heaters that just heat the general electronics. And it, they think they can do that for an hour, uh, which means that they've got enough power to heat up the thruster fuel lines and get rid of the clogging. Uh, if they, they can do that for an hour, then they think they'll fix it. Uh, and uh, that so so, uh, but you only lose the spacecraft power for an hour, the main spacecraft heating power, and then you put it back on again. Um, so that's the plan, uh, or that was the plan, because in fact they've done it. They did it on ah. August the twenty seventh, and they confirmed that the thruster was back in action and keeping Voyager 1 pointed back towards the Earth. Uh, but the reason why I've dwelt on this story, Andrew, apart from you know filling up the time that we have to fill up for your radio show, uh, <laughs> is uh, because, <laughs> because it just shows you know the sort of steps, the logical steps that go into the, uh, what engineers do to keep things working. When you think something that far away, 164 times as far away from us as the Earth is from the sun, you'd think something that far away, you'd just give up on it. You'd say, no, it's no way we're going to fix this. Sadly, oh, yeah. But it hasn't, and it's still going strong. It, it's amazing because they never would have anticipated this scenario because it, mm. it never was designed to last this long or to go as far as it's gone, although they probably anticipated that it might do that. But they probably didn't think it'd still be operational to a certain degree, and yet it's still out there. So as Voyager two, they're, um, they're they're plodding along beautifully. I, I worked it out, Fred, and I don't know how to say this because uh, English and Australian terminology is different from US. But um, based on my calculations, it's twenty four thousand six hundred million kilometers from Earth. Yeah, that's about. I think that's about right. Twenty four yeah. million. Yes, twenty four billion or yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. Mm. It's um, yeah, that's it's uh, yeah, it's a long way off. Uh, and as you said, forty seven years. You know, um, it, it is extraordinary. Uh, and uh, so the the instruments that are still sensing what's going on out there. I think there's things like magnetometers that are measuring the magnetic field. That's how they know that they're beyond the sun's field. Uh, sphere of magnetic influence so all that's um why voyager one is still worth keeping going yeah, um, yeah. it will eventually however fade out because the the power coming from the the radioisotope thermoelectric generator is now much much less than it was at the start of the mission um uh, it's a plutonium 238 uh heat element basically uh that that the decay of that plutonium dies down it's got a certain half-life i can't remember what it is but the the bottom line is i think by about the mid 2030s we expect that there simply won't be enough power even to keep those few instruments going uh and run the transmitters to send the signals back to earth so we will probably lose Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 somewhere down the track, which will be a very sad time because it's, mm. it's just been part of everybody's life oh, <laughs> half a century. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to know how much life they've got left in them. They, I, I guess they could uh, take a punt and say, oh, you know, we might get another decade or 20 years. Who knows? Mm. It's, um, yeah, um, it's gone way beyond its uh, use-by date, so... Um, they can't right. complain. Yeah. They can't complain at all. Yeah. 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 Been extraordinary. And and uh, hats off to roadside assistance. They did a terrific job. <laughs> yeah, from from a laboratory in California. <laughs> yeah, good good job. Brilliant stuff. Uh, if you'd like to read that story, it's on the SciTechDaily dot com website. So this is Space Nuts with Andrew and Fred. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, uh, Fred, uh, to something a little bit more dark and uh, foreboding, and that is a uh, very aptly named asteroid called Apophis. Now, this one's been in the news on and off for quite a while now. Uh, of course, the popular press is always going with the headline, Apophis headed for Earth, which always scares the bejeebies out of people. <laughs> yes, uh, but it was determined that it probably would miss the next three passes. But now... <laughs> Now somebody else has gone, hang on a minute. It will miss us, but 
there are scenarios that will cause it uh, cause it to hit us. What <laughs> possibly? Yeah. This guy's yeah. got way too much spare time, but I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of glad he has because you have to consider all options. Yes, you do. That's right. Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely right. So um, this is um, a scientist at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, uh, and um, essentially uh, the work that has been done is to confirm, yes, that at the moment uh, the near passes of Apophis, which are in 2029, 2036, and 2068, will not cause an impact with Earth. They're, they're close passes, but won't be an impact. Um, what he said, and his name's Paul Wiegert, or Wiegert, uh, he says, but wait a minute, <laughs> yes. what if... Um, what if something hit Apophis? Uh, and what are the odds of a smaller object hitting it and changing its course just enough that it would put it on a collision course with Earth? So it's it, it's a what-if scenario on the grand scale, I guess, because this is quite significant stuff. Apophis is, uh, I can't remember its diameter, but it's big enough to make a a big yep. mess of, of uh, parts of the planet if it hit. So um, he, he, what he did, he, he, and, and as you as you would when you embark on a study like this, it 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 depends the the event. Oh, sorry, the outcome of a collision depends first of all on how big the object is that you collide with, and secondly, what speed it's going at, because both of those things would produce different effects. And so uh, what uh, Paul did was to look at different scenarios. And he started off um, with with uh, asteroids. And this is a very small asteroid, 60 centimeter asteroid, which I would call a meteoroid, actually. Uh, an object 60 centimeters across could actually knock the asteroid into a collision course. And that's surprising because that's not very big. No. Um, and again, it depends on how long you've got. You know, if, if that uh, happened now, then you might get a collision in 2029. If it happened in five years' time, it might not because the, there's, there's that sort of uh, um, duration that it takes for uh, uh, the orbital characteristics to change. Um he okay, so twenty 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 nine um would be the collision date. Uh um for maybe that small object, but more likely if you up the size a bit, uh then you uh he thought about things uh, three point four meters across. That's a significant piece of space rock. That could move it into a collision course by 2029, so it could change it dramatically. Um, and then um, basically what he did was he estimated how many objects there are of that sort of size uh, that could do the collision, and then he um, basically used that number to calculate, and I think this is a 3.4-metre one uh, scenario, uh, the, 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 he took that number of objects, which he, we can estimate quite accurately, uh, and discovered that if he calculates the odds of one of those objects hitting Apophis, uh, this is just hitting it, not necessarily moving it into a course to, to hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, just hitting it would be one in uh, 100 million. <laughs> so ah. it's pretty low odds uh, that, uh, that, that Apophis will be hit by anything else. And then he, he said, well, it, for it to hit the Earth, for it to make a puffis hit the earth, that collision's got to be at just the right angle too. Yeah. Uh, and so what's the odds of uh, it hitting at the right angle? Well, they are one in two billion. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, that's that. And then on top of that, you've got the chances of a collision like that um, making um, a, a, an impact with earth being one in one million. So you've got to multiply all those together, uh, yeah. which um, now one in two billion times one in one million is uh, is a lot. And then one in one in hundred million is a lot more. So the chances are very small. Uh, the increase in statistical probability that Apophis will hit the earth. 
So at least he's done it. He's done the calculation and he's shown that the risk is uh, very small. Of, it's the minuscule, the to it. but it's yeah, minuscule, so, but... So, yeah. For, for for it to happen, you've got to have one thing happen at the right angle to make another thing happen at the right angle to make another thing happen, which is impact, happen at the right angle and yeah. put it all together and it's uh, a squillion's worth of probability. That's right. Mm. Yes, we've got a um, zeros there. I couldn't help myself, Fred. I had to go through the news headlines on this story and, and most of the um, news outlets and science outlets are, are, are basically, you know, playing a straight bat. Uh, asteroid Apophis won't hit Earth in 2029 unless this freaky scenario plays out. That's one yes. headline. Okay, yeah. oh, God, of chaos, one. God of Chaos Asteroid Apophis could still hit Earth in 2029 study hints, but we won't know for three more years. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit. That's a bit of creative license. Odds of is, yeah. uh, asteroid triple nine four two Apophis striking Earth slightly higher than thought. Okay, that's a straight bat. Uh, simulation yeah. shows what would happen if God of Chaos asteroid collided with Earth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, could, not really. <laughs> yeah, each way bet. Astrophysicist yeah. predicts slightly higher chance for major asteroid impact in twenty twenty nine. Um, I, I'll go down to one of the ones I really like. Uh, this one, large asteroid hurtles towards Earth. ISRO warns worst case scenario. <laughs> they're not. They're not hiding behind the truth much. <laughs> um, God of Chaos, yeah. the most hazardous asteroid that could hit Earth. New study reveals shocking possibility. Yeah, oh, I love that. Yes. You know, it all, yeah. you can you can put it all in a headline. And yeah. you can either tell the yeah. truth or you can just leave a bit out that still the truth, but sounds much mm. more horrifying. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm shocked by what I've just talked about. No. <laughs> no. Yes, but, you know, it's a non-zero statistic, so that's a shocking possibility. Well, yeah, non-zero statistics are uh, always a bit scary, um, mm. depending on the thing that you're talking about, I suppose, but uh, when it comes to getting obliterated by a, um, a rather large asteroid, this one's pretty big, isn't it? It's um, oh, Yes, I, I can't remember offhand. Is it a kilometre or thereabouts? I think it is. I'm going to have to look it up now. Uh, have a look. Have a look. <laughs> Put me out of my misery. Well, it might take me a while. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, it is 370 metres. There you go. Okay, so third, third of a kilometer. That's still yeah. big enough to to be very hurtful. Yeah, we know about could it. Do, that could do earth. some damage that one. If you'd like to read about Apophis, just do a search for the current news online. It'll pop up on I just, just put a shocking platform. news. Yeah, shock. Just put <laughs> shocking, shocking news into your shocking news about Apophis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I love headlines. Actually, I think uh, people with the best jobs in the world are sub-editors because they get to write some really cool headlines sometimes. They mm. they come up with some real pearls. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Uh, finally, Fred, to a festering pustule in space known as the <laughs> Red Giant. <laughs> That sounds like a headline. Uh. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Um, but, but this is a particular star that's caught some attention because they've uh, managed to get a really good look at it and it's uh, showing some uh, amazing uh, activity, I suppose. This is um, something that was captured by ALMA and it's the R. Doradus star. Uh, it's yep. pretty big, this one, much bigger than ours, thank goodness. It is. It's a it's a red giant star. Um, mm. it, uh, it's actually one of the things that's really interesting about this story is that uh, the star has about the same mass as our sun, uh, and even though it's a much bigger star, it's a, it's a, you know it's a, its atmosphere is very rarefied. It's it's about three hundred and fifty times the diameter of the sun. Uh, but it's got a similar mass to the sun, and that tells you that this what we're seeing with this star is pretty well what the sun's going to do at the end of its life in right. a billion years' time. So this is uh, foretelling what the future will be. Uh, you're quite right. It's sort of in the middle distance, about 180 light years away, 
uh, our Doradus in the constellation of Dorado, Southern Hemisphere constellation. And it uh, has been imaged, as you quite rightly say, by ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So these images are not visible light that we're talking about. They're in the high frequency, very high frequency radio spectrum. Uh, and what they've done is actually image the disk of the star, which is fantastic. I mean, um, stars are so far away that the general rule is that no matter how big your telescope is, you're not going to see detail on the star. And there are a few exceptions. Uh, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, we think we can see detail on uh, when you image it with VLTI, the Very Large Telescope Interferometer. Uh, that's at Cerro Paranal in northern Chile, run by the European Southern Observatory. Um, but uh, with this, these observations of our Doradus, you're, you're, you're seeing um, a detail, fairly fine detail on the surface of this star. And so you need a big interferometer array to do that. Uh, our ALMA covers quite a large area of the Chanyantor uh, Plateau uh, in the northern part of the Atacama, not very far from San Pedro de Atacama. Very high up, it's about n nearly 5,000 metres, the telescope. And so its capabilities are really quite outstanding. And you and I have talked many times, Andrew, about the images that we've seen from ALMA of protoplanetary disks, the disk yep. of, of material that are going to form planets. This time it's turned its attention not to the disk around the star, but to the star itself. And mm. uh, what they've revealed is these hotspots on the surface of the star. Uh, they're interpreted as being hot, rising bubbles of gas, what we call convection bubbles. Um, now, we have those on the sun, but the ones on the sun are only, you know, probably 10 to 100 kilometres across. They're relatively small. These are, as I said at the beginning, 70 or 75 times bigger than the sun itself. They're very large blobs of material uh, which are convecting. And we know they're doing that because uh, the ALMA images of Ardoradus uh, have covered uh, a period of the best part of a month um, they've taken repeated objects, uh, sorry, repeated images, uh, the 18th of July, the 27th of July, and the 2nd of August. And these are actually last year, not this year, because it's taken a while to process the images. But what you can see, because you've, you've got these three different epochs, times when you're looking at that, uh, the bubbles are in different places. So they're sort of blub bubbling up and changing uh, as time goes on. And, and you, you can identify the way they're changing, because the, the, the last two that I mentioned are, t are taken only about five days apart. And you can identify the individual bubbles uh, changing in their brightness, uh, mm. as well as moving slightly on the disk of the star. So these are real, real events that we're picking up, and we're seeing their activity as the star kind of rumbles and boils. Uh, what, what, you, said, what you're actually seeing here, Fred, is a gargantuan lava a lava lamp. That's what this is. It, 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 yes, it is. That's right. With uh, with blobs coming up that are not made of lava, <laughs> they're made of gas. Yeah, but, yeah they are blobs, and uh, yeah, the gigant a gigantic lava lamp. Yeah, so we can obviously learn a lot from this. We can. Um, I mean, th this sort of activity has been predicted by the people who look at the physics of, of stars, uh, so it's not a surprise. And we do know, um, my colleagues who I often talk to at the University of Southern Queensland, they specialise in looking at star spots uh, on stars as well, which they can do with a technique called doppler Zeeman imaging. Uh, that lets them use actually telescopes like the Anglo-Australian telescope, quite small instruments to, to plot where the star, pots, star spots are on a star. Uh, and they are gigantic. Often they're much, much bigger than the sunspots that we see on the sun. And, in the, and there are reasons for that. That's well understood. And in the same way, we understand why uh, you should get very big convective blobs on red giant stars. But... Seeing them is believing, and that's the yeah. big thing. When we have confirmation of theoretical predictions like this, it is very gratifying that the theory is working and that you know the things that we think we know about the universe are not just made-up stories. They're the real thing. Yeah, theory is becoming reality now that we've got the gear to, to make these observations yes. over such vast distances. Mm. 
That's it's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, SciTechDaily.com is where you'll find the story about uh, the, um, the the big blob in space that's uh, basically that giant lava lamp known as uh, Doradus. Uh, R. Doradus or da- R. Doradus? How do you pronounce it? Well, usually, yeah. Normally it's Doradus, the, yeah. the, the constellation name. And R, R tells you that um, it's a variable star. So uh, that was, I don't know, is that right? Yes, yes, it is. It's telling it's a variable star. Well, obviously, with all that movement, it's fitting, yeah, varying all yeah, the time. No, the, the, the reason why uh, I say that is um, it's the nomenclature. So letters like that, and often there are two letters. Uh, I used to study stars called R.L. Irie stars, which is, uh, that, that's telling you that they're variable stars, the fact that you've got two letters in the name, and one's the same. Too. Excellent. All right. Uh, that's where we're going to leave uh, this week's program. If you would like to get in touch with us or just uh, pop along to our website for a look around, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. If you follow us on social media, don't forget to like us or follow us or uh, subscribe or whatever it is you do, depending on which platform it is. We'd uh, love to get our numbers up. And don't forget to leave a review, if you don't mind, uh, whatever you uh, listen to us through. Leave a review. Reviews are always helpful to uh, well, increase increase our um, listener awareness, I suppose would be the way to describe it. Thanks, Fred, as always. A great pleasure. Great pleasure to talk to you too, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and thanks to Hugh in the studio for what I do not know, but we'll figure it out later. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.